In my defense, it was never my intent to write this book. I did not have time, no one asked me to, and several people strongly cautioned against it. Not now. Not with the literal and figurative fires roiling our planet, and certainly not about this. Other Naomi. That is how I refer to her now, this person with whom I have been chronically confused for over a decade. My big haired doppelganger. A person whom so many others appear to find indistinguishable from me. A person who does many extreme things that cause strangers to chastise me, or thank me, or express their pity for me. The very fact that I refer to her with any kind of code speaks to the absurdity of my situation. For a quarter of a century, I have been a person who writes about corporate power and its ravages. I sneak into abusive factories in faraway countries and across borders to military occupations. I report in the aftermath of oil spills and Category 5 hurricanes. I write books of big ideas about serious subjects. And yet, in the months and years when this text came into being, a time when cemeteries ran out of space and billionaires blasted themselves into outer space, everything else that I had to write or might have written appeared only as an unwanted intrusion, a rude interruption. In June 2021, as this project began to truly spiral out of my control, a strange new weather event, dubbed a heat dome, descended on the southern coast of British Columbia, the part of Canada where I now live with my family. The thick air felt like a snarling invasive entity with malevolent intent. More than 600 people died, most of them elderly, an estimated 10 billion marine creatures were cooked alive on our shores. An entire town went up in flames. It's rare for this out of the way, sparsely populated spot to make international headlines, but the heat dome made us briefly famous. An editor in New York asked if I, as someone engaged in the climate fight for 15 years, would file a report about what it was like to live through this unprecedented climate event. I'm working on something else, I told him, the stench of death filling my nostrils. Can I ask what? You cannot. <laughs> there were plenty of other important things I neglected during this time of feverish subterfuge. That summer, I allowed my nine-year-old to spend so many hours watching a gory nature series called Animal Fight Club that he began to ram me at my desk like a great white shark. I engaged in all of this neglect so that I could, what? Check her serially suspended Twitter account? Study her appearances on Steve Bannon's live streams for insights into their electric chemistry? Read or listen to yet another of her warnings that basic health measures were actually a covert plot orchestrated by the Chinese Communist Party, Bill Gates, Anthony Fauci, and the World Economic Forum to sow mass death on such a scale it could only be the work of the devil himself. My greatest shame rests with the unspeakable number of podcasts I mainlined, the sheer volume of hours lost that I will never get back a master's degree worth of hours. I told myself it was research, that if I was going to understand her and her fellow travelers who are now in open warfare against objective reality, I had to immerse myself in the archive of several extremely prolific and editing averse weekly and twice weekly shows with names like QAnon Anonymous and Conspirituality that unpack and deconstruct the commingling worlds of conspiracy theories, wellness hucksters, and their various intersections with COVID-19 denial, anti-vaccine hysteria, and rising fascism. This on top of keeping up with the daily output from Bannon and Tucker Carlson, on whose shows Other Naomi had become a regular guest. I told myself I had no choice, that this was not in fact an epically frivolous and narcissistic waste of my compressed writing time, 
or the compressed time on the clock of our fast-warming planet. I rationalize that other Naomi as one of the most effective creators and disseminators of, of misinformation and disinformation about many of our most urgent crises, and as someone who has seemingly helped inspire large numbers of people to take to the streets in rebellion against an almost wholly hallucinated tyranny, she is at the nexus of several forces that, while ridiculous in the extreme, are nonetheless important since the confusion they sow and the oxygen they absorb increasingly stand in the way of pretty much anything helpful or healthful that humans might at some point decide to do together. If doppelganger literature and mythology is any guide, when confronted with the appearance of one's double, a person is duty bound to go on a journey, a quest to understand what messages, secrets, and forebodings are being offered. So that is what I have done. Rather than push my doppelganger away, I have attempted to learn everything I can about her and the movements of which she is part. I followed her as she burrowed deeper and deeper into a warren of conspiracy rabbit holes, places where it often seems that my own shock doctrine research has gone through the looking glass and is now gazing back at me as a network of fantastical plots that, caught, that cast the very real crises we face, from COVID to climate change to Russian military aggression, as false flag attacks planted by the Chinese communists slash corporate globalists slash Jews. I tracked her new alliances with some of the most malevolent men on the planet, the ones sowing information chaos on a mass scale and gleefully egging on insurrections in country after country. I investigated their rewards, political, emotional, and financial, and explored the deep racial, cultural, and historical fears and denials off of which they feed. Most of all, I tried to figure out what kind of responses might drain these heavily armed anti-democratic forces of their fast-growing power. I felt justified in this pursuit. I have been confused with other Naomi for so long and so frequently that I have often felt she was following me. It seemed only right that I should follow her back. Thanks. <laughs> A huge, huge thank you to the Chicago Humanities Festival. It is wonderful to be back. Uh, I want to thank my publisher, uh, Farrar strauss giroux and most of all, my incredible friend uh, and inspiration and companion on this journey, V. Thank you for that staggering introduction. Well, I love that opening so much. <laughs> um, I think it's so amazing, this book, because it's really different than any of your other books. It's more personal, it's more vulnerable, um, it's funny. I'm not that you haven't been funny before, but you haven't been that funny. You're really funny in this book. Um, and I think it's really in keeping in alignment somehow with both the state you were in before you wrote the book, kind of, as I remember it, as your friend, there was a despair about where we were, all that we had lost, you know, our, our movements from Bernie to Black Lives Matter to everybody, everything else that was happening, and, and just a despair that was overwhelming you. And then suddenly there was this idea for this book and there, there was a, a new way that you wanted to write the book. So why don't you begin just talking about what that was about, the process of, of wanting to be a, a really a different kind of writer even in doing this book. Yeah. Well. I, and, I, and I will share that you had a very important role in that, in that uh, process. But yeah, this, the origins of this book are really the, about, you know, about eight months into the pandemic, after the election, once Trump was you know, scraped out of the White House. And you know, I think up, up until that point, we'd all been kind of working with manic intensity. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I had been part of the Bernie campaign, which is what I had been doing right when everything shut down. So I think there's a particular kind of vertigo. The last time we saw each other was, you know, at one of these huge rallies, right? And, and then the next thing we knew, we were all in our homes and watching that slip away. Mm -hmm. And 
And then there was another opening, you know, then there was the summer of 2020, or the spring and summer of 2020, and this excavation and reckoning, which is what your last incredible book is titled, and, you know, and, and COVID was a reckoning, and there was all this organizing about, well, how do we learn the lessons of this moment, of, of the way we have treated so many people as sacrificial, mm. the people who hold the world up, and, you know, COVID was a searchlight, right? And you've written about this and you did all that organizing in the early months with poultry workers, with mm. nurses, like with the people who were allowing people like us to stay home, right? Mm. And there was, it was a hopeful period mm. because of that, because people were choosing to see things that they had chosen not to see before, including racist police murders um, and a desire to re this our settler colonial states. And then something shifted, mm -hmm. which where, uh, and, and movements started falling apart and people were turning on each other. And I found myself in a very speechless state where I have always done a certain kind of political writing um, that has a thesis and, you know, puts it up front and says, okay, we're going to climb up this fact mountain together and we're going we're gonna to get to the top and we're going to say that we got there. And I guess I had lost faith in, 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 in the idea that there was a connection between mm -hmm. the ability to make a, an argument and to marshal facts and have that be part of a process of, of changing the world. And I don't believe books change the world, but I do believe that there, you know, I've always believed that there's a, a conversation between ideas and movements. Um, and that's, you know, the, that's, that conversation is the meaning of my life, you know? Um, and that, that, I was suddenly, I suddenly lost the faith. And that's when I called you and said, I think I need to go to writing school. Um, and and I, I, I said, you know, I really did. I called V and I said, you know, I, for the first time I'm not traveling. I was going to take a new job at a university at UBC and University of British Columbia, but I wasn't yet in the job. Mm -hmm. So I had time, I was in one place, and I had never studied writing. I, I, I studied literature and philosophy as an undergrad, but I had never taken a creative writing course. I just taught myself how to write. And so I thought, well, maybe, uh, maybe I'll, I, I, I had heard that Iowa um, was doing online courses, so, I was asked V about this, and basically you were like, that's a bad idea, you're <laughs> gonna feel self-conscious because people will know who you are. Um, but I know this person, and why don't you tell that part, that part of it? Well, I, you know, I thought it, first of all, the humility of Naomi Klein deciding that she wants to go to writing school is kind of amazing, right? So just to be in the position where she was asking me what school she would go to um, <laughs> seemed really bizarre, but um, I, <laughs> I know this wonderful young woman who I've known for a very long time. It, it's, it, that story is a story in itself, but she happens to be a brilliant writer and an even an equally brilliant teacher. And she taught it. She taught creative writing at Stanford. And I knew she wasn't teaching, and I knew she was also in lockdown and was going through her own. And I, I just thought she's a wildly brilliant person. She's very funny. And she's just the person Naomi needs. Like, she will help Naomi in a way, I think, push her out to another dimension of herself, right? <laughs> and I think that's exactly what happened, right? You know? Well, it was really... Her yeah. name is Harriet Clark, by the way. Her yeah. name is Harriet Clark. She's a, a brilliant writer. And, but it was like going, being an undergrad again. I had little writing assignments and reading lists, and, and, and um, it was a safe place to experiment. And I was experimenting with different forms with Harriet. And then when I wasn't doing that, I would go online and just deal with the fact that thousands of people every day were mistaking me for Naomi Wolf, <laughs> which was happening at the same period. And I would complain to Harriet about it. Um, and then it just occurred to me, maybe I can mulch this. <laughs> you know, maybe this is material. Um, and, and, they, and then we were off to the races, more or less, with this strange idea of using my identity confusion and this uncanny experience of having a great many people confuse me for Wolf during the pandemic. Um, 
as a way to get at the uncanniness of now, mm -hmm. right? At the way to, to get at the, these weird new political alliances, this sense of vertigo that, I, that me and my friends would talk about all the time, like not knowing who we could trust. People are changing so many conversations. I can't talk to my uncle anymore. I can't talk to my sister anymore. People are changing. And I thought, well, you know, maybe this is a narrow aperture um, to open up this broader uncanny world. Even the uncanny weather, like that heat dome. You know, a heat dome is weird in the Pacific Northwest because it's uncanny weather. Like, we are not, we are not an ecosystem that can handle that kind of heat, mm -hmm. right? It's, you know, it's one thing if, it, if it's in Phoenix, but if it's in the Pacific Northwest, it's just whose weather is this, right? right? That's how it feels. Yeah. Well, I, th I think, for those of you who haven't read the book, I think the whole journey with the other Naomi is a very, it's just a very moving, disturbing journey in many, many ways. And I would love for you to tell the story you tell in the book of being in the bathroom and overhearing people talking because I think it kind of, for me, it kind of ignites the journey, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, the first chapter, now I was reading from the, the introduction, but the first chapter begins with this scene that actually happened a long time ago in 2011, but it's the first time I was confronted with the reality that a lot of people thought I was someone else, and I, it was during Occupy Wall Street, so I always remember when it was. It was 2011, and I was at Zuccotti Park in New York, um, and I was, I was doing research for my book, This Changes Everything, uh, and I was interviewing organizers, and there was a march that day through the financial district, a kind of show of strength, because there had been threats to ev evict the, 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 uh, the occupiers. And we, we, were, <laughs> we were there together. And, um, and as I needed a, a, a restroom uh, during the march, and so did several other marchers, and I was in the stall, and I overheard two women trashing me, you know, and so it like brought up every mean girl high school, you know, did you hear what Naomi Klein wrote? Oh my God, like she really does not understand. And I just froze like, oh my God, <laughs> this is my worst nightmare. <laughs> and, and then I listened and as I listened, it became clear that they were talking about an article that I had read but not written, <laughs> which was this very strange article that Naomi Wolf had written where, if those of you who remember Occupy Wall Street will remember that Occupy Wall Street didn't have a set of demands. Um, and uh, that was a political decision that, that, so that it, was, that it wasn't like politicians could just do one thing and people would be happy. It was, it was a wail against the whole economic system. And, um, and Wolf had decided that she knew what the demands were because she had talked to a couple people. So she had written an article saying, I have figured out what the demands are. And so this is the funny thing about having a doppelganger is like that may not seem like that big a deal, but I, I, I think I said to you before, like if you were to like, like in a lab cook up like the, a doppelganger that was specifically designed to sort of trigger me, it would be that sort of thing. <laughs> also making factual errors live on the BBC, um, which also happened. Um, but like for me, because I've been part of social movements for a long time, I'm really, really careful not to speak for movements because um, I think it can be really problematic when writers you know, take, become like the face of a, of, of, a, of a grassroots movement. So that's always been complicated for me. And so to have somebody be like, I have figured out the demands <laughs> and have people think that that was me was, 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 was a trip. And there have been many moments like that, like during COVID. The reason why it got so much worse during COVID is that she took this, um, uh, star turn on the right. She started being on Fox News all the time and on Tucker and, and on uh, Steve Bannon's show almost every day for a while. And she was making an argument about COVID, like I said in that reading, that sort of sounded like the shock doctrine, right? Like they're using this pandemic, maybe it was created, maybe it's a bioweapon in order to push through the new world order, great reset, and so on. Um, I, I think there were real examples of the shock doctrine, and there still are. There are still ways that, that the pandemic are being exploited by pharmaceutical companies to enrich themselves, but more than that, to attack public healthcare systems, to attack public schools. Um, so I think there are real things, you know, tech companies are exploiting it, but this was different. This was like much, much more conspiratorial. Um, and so it was like, 
it was like watching a bizarro version of, of, of me. And so, you know, doppelgangers are interesting because they challenge, I think the reason why there's so many books and films about doppelgangers is because probably a lot of writers care about their, their image, you know, back to Dostoevsky yeah. and Edgar Allan Poe and Philip Roth, like, you know, um, we like to see our names on titles, like it's not, it, it uh, un uncovers, it's, it, 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 I think it does attract a certain personality type. And so this idea that there's, that you could lose control over your public self is something that mm -hmm. writers are drawn to again and again and filmmakers are drawn to again and again, but also it, it, it lights up this fundamental truth about hu being human, which is that we can tr try very, very hard to polish up ourselves and control ourselves and perfect ourselves and perform ourselves and do all of those things. But we are at the mercy, ultimately, of forces beyond our control. Ourselves can be undone in an instant, right? By an accident, a diagnosis, you know, uh, um, a bad trip, a bad tweet, right? We are we are not in control and we try to claim that we are. Um, and so the idea that there's another you or someone that the world perceives to be you out there wreaking havoc is just this theme that returns again and again in literature. I think because it speaks to that just difficult truth, mm. we are not in control of ourselves. Mm. It's so true, and particularly now, I think mm. precarity in all fronts is more escalated than it's ever been. I was thinking a lot about Naomi Wolf, because I met her at a certain point in my life, and Naomi Wolf was really smart and, and really onto a lot of things in her early days, and her descent into this other, what you call the mirror world, for me has been very alarming and very upsetting. And I think you have ingredients and ideas of why people are making this descent. Uh, a lot of people we know who are formerly leftists or who had a different way of, of, of seeing the world have gone over. And I'd just like you to talk to, why is this happening? Like, what is at the core of that um, descent? Mm. Yeah, and you know, in the book I have this little fake, like it's, it's a jokey formula for some other, for for well-known public figures who have made a similar transition. And, and, and you know, I, I, I focus on Wolf not as the subject matter of the book, but as a case study and also as, a, as kind of the white rabbit in Alice in Wonderland leading me down the rabbit hole. And then, you know, the book becomes about the rabbit hole and who else is down there, in particular figures like Bannon and trying to understand what they're getting from her, which I think is really... Hmm. In, in some ways more important for us to understand than what she's getting from them, like why she would have made this migration. But the equation is narcissism, bracket, grandiosity, um, plus, or we might say multiplied by social media addiction. Every single person who has made this migration is a, is a Twitter addict of one kind or another, just cannot get offline, is really, really hooked on these dopamine hits, and really looking to the internet to tell them who they are, right? Just as I was during the pandemic, going like, who am I? And they were like, you're that person. <laughs> so I was like, I'll write a book about it. <laughs> um, so multiplied by social media addiction, um, plus midlife crisis, like, and a fear around relevance, okay? Um, Divided by public shaming, um, or fear of public shaming, mm -hmm. Russell Brand. Um, but like a very, very public um, uh, 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 accountability, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, equals right-wing meltdown. I mean, I'm not saying everyone ticks every box, but it's useful, you'll see. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but the public shaming thing is, is important because there was this really, right before the pandemic, there was this her horrific moment where she was found live, so she was being interviewed about a book that she wrote called Outrages, which was a historical work that dealt in large part with the persecution of gay men in England. And she had, it turns out, misread the court records. And a, 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 some of you may remember this absolutely excruciating moment where she was being interviewed and um, the interviewer said, you, you misunderstood this, this, this term where you think that those people were executed, but actually what it means is that they were exonerated. Um, 
And so the bottom <laughs> fell out of her book, and her publisher dropped her. And and that and you know the truth is that that what that interviewer did, he was doing his job. He found a massive error in someone's book, and he and he made the most of it live on the BBC. I know because people think I made that mistake. Um, and this is what I, this is what I mean. Like if you were to if you were to cook up. <laughs> Well, usually I, I can't tell you how I many phone calls I've gotten <laughs> saying, oh no, I screwed up on the BBC, right? <laughs> well, I always have to reverse engineer it because first, like, I'll see, I'll see things like, the real victim here is Naomi Klein. I'll be like, what happened? What did, I, what did, I, what did she do now? <laughs> oh, but, but, okay, so I think we have to hold each other accountable. We have to take facts seriously. But what happened after that was one of these really, really, I think, excruciating Twitter pylons, social media pylons, where people were taking a lot of joy in, in that moment. They were making memes and videos and putting it to music and just going to town. And, and I do think that that is part mm -hmm. of why some folks like this make the, 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 the migration, um, the, the, the migration of the minds uh, has to do with a, like a, a kind of a cruelty, and, and, mm -hmm. but also a feeling like there's nothing left for me here in this world. Yeah. Well, I think that's a really important point. I, I, I was beginning a project and I was interviewing a lot of young women who had become right-wingers, members of the KKK, mm -hmm. um, people who were doing really um, dark, dark things. Mm. And I was interviewing them and really trying to understand why. Like, what was their journey? What, what led them there? And every single case, that girl had been bullied, mm -hmm. had been made to feel like she was dumb and, and yeah. ugly, had been raped, had been an outcast, yeah. and had found a community and had found a place where she belonged and yeah. was invited in. And so it really got me thinking about how the left sometimes rather than seeing people at moments of vulnerability where we can reach out to them and bring them over, um, either ignores people, and, and I think this is true in terms of the Democrats and in, in terms of looking at how we treat the working class and how we treat people who are outside a certain um, reality, but what do we do in the case of Naomi Wolf, who's made a huge mistake publicly, who's who, who's made a bad era and very bad judgment in her work, mm -hmm. but who has done real work in the world that's been substantial and suddenly gets dismissed, discarded, canceled, ridiculed, shamed in the public square. Mm -hmm. um, that's enough to drive most people completely insane. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think, what do we do in this world mm -hmm. about that? I'm just mm -hmm. curious what, you know, what this book taught you about that. Well, I mean, one of the things it taught me is that a lot of people in my world are in profound denial about what happens when people get ejected from sort of polite liberal or left society. Because when, um, like at a certain point in the pandemic, Wolf was um, kicked off Twitter. She's back, obviously, because of Musk, but it's not called Twitter anymore. Um, but you know, she had been had her account suspended multiple times, but finally she was she was permanently. It turns out not permanently, but she lost her account. And there was, once again, a frenzy of memes and mockery and, you know, some, like, literally people were tweeting, ding dong, the witch is dead. They were, they were saying RIP, you know. And, the, and there was absolutely a feeling that since she was off this platform, she no longer existed. Like, she had been ejected from planet Earth because she was no longer, you know, in the Guardian and no longer, no longer, you know, in, 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 in the bubble. And what I knew, because by this point, I was already quite fascinated with what, with where she was going. What I knew is that she now had a platform that was larger than anything she had had since mm. her beauty myth days, since she was advising Al Gore. I mean, Tucker Carlson was bringing her to three million people a night. Steve Bannon has, you know, he claims hundreds of millions of downloads of, of his podcast. The two of them published a book together. Um, so, I, you know, I, it's almost like kids who think like the world disappears when they cover their eyes, you know? Um, it, they, they are, they, 
we, and there's often this feeling of like, well, we don't want to give them attention as if we are the ones who are controlling attention. And I, you know, I, I, I think we need to understand what is going on there. And like I said, what interests me is less what she's getting from Bannon, which is all the attention following, you know, income. It's she monetizes it. She's good at the internet. She knows how to sell subscriptions. She knows how to use being deplatformed as evidence of her truth telling, which is another very important move in what I call the mirror world. But Bannon, there's a reason Bannon has her on the show every day, uh, you know, for periods, and the reason, there's reasons why he um, is lifting her up as much as he is, despite her being a Jewish feminist, you know, who generally is not his favorite type of person. He sees her, and he, has, he, 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 he says all the, all the warrior moms are listening to Naomi Wolf, that's what he says. And he also told her that he thought that he, she was one of his top candidates for women of, of the year. So he sees a lot of anger, particularly in white women. He knows that if Trump's going to get back or somebody Trump-like, they have to do better with women, right? Um, he's very good at peeling away parts of the Democratic base. He did it with working class union members who were pissed off about free trade last time. And now he sees a lot of potential with women who had a very hard time during COVID, opposed uh, masks and vaccine mandates, and he pivots them over to transphobia, pivots them over to book banning, and casts it all as grooming, you know, our poor kids, mm -hmm. um, abusing our poor kids. Uh, that's that. That's the the sort of the framework. But he, you know, he's a strategist, and it's it. And I find it alarming that we don't take it more seriously, given his track record. Um, you know, he, he know he, he's, he's done it before, so we should not, we should not, uh, um, you know, we should not discount his capacity as a strategist, as a political strategist. He says his goal is to take power for 100 years. I think we should believe that that is indeed his goal. Mm. I think one of the reasons I admire you so much is, like, people often say that I go to really dark places emotionally, and mm. I go to places people don't want to go, but you go to places in the mind that I find really scary. I think all of, of the people who have flipped into conspiracy world, um, I think I have an aversion to it on some level and you've really helped me enter that world and yeah. think about it as opposed to saying, um, don't give it attention. But what role does conspiracy culture have in our culture? What is it doing to our culture? Yeah, and I think, I think that it's really important to make a distinction between people who are like really big players in this world. Sorry, I've had my back to this entire part of the room. <laughs> Hi. So, you know, I, I try to be judicious around not referring to Wolf or Bannon as conspiracy theorists. That's a smear that I have faced as a leftist. You know, people call the shock doctrine a conspiracy theory when it came out in 2007. Now it gets treated like, oh, obviously this is a tactic that happens after the Maui fires, after every disaster. It's a, it's a, it's a consistently used as a way to smear the left. It was done to Noam Chomsky. It's, you know, it, I mean, it's, it's done to every major left figure um, and it's, who, who tries to identify a system Right, uh, um, and you know when you talk about a system, um, it often threatens people who are inside that system. So, like when Chomsky wrote *Manufacturing Consent*, um, he was talking about how the 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 the, the um, business model of mainstream media created incentives to not cover certain things, and then people said, "Well, that's a conspiracy theory because I don't take you know I don't take." Direct directives from advertisers, but that's not what he was saying. He was saying it was a system, right? Um, so there are the conspiracy influencers, and they move from theory to theory that often contradicts, you know, so one minute COVID is a bioweapon, the next minute it's just, a co it's just a cold, don't worry about it. And they don't try to reconcile. It's more like climate change deniers. It's a tactic I've seen, which is really just doubt is our product. Um, so I think there are economic reasons why this is happening. You know, there are conspiracy theories always surge during, in uncertain times, but what we're now seeing is the attention economy meeting uncertain times in conspiracy theories and this ability to monetize. Um, 
But that doesn't answer why they have such a large market, right? There are the people who, they're the reason why you can get so rich spinning conspiracy theories is because millions of people are looking to make sense of the world, right? Mm -hmm. And COVID was a moment where a lot of us were going online to try to understand something. Um, but now that there are no vaccine mandates or mask mandates, um, this culture isn't going anywhere. It's still surging. And you know, I think figures like Russell Brand, who we should talk about, because um, you know, I think I think for a figure like him, you know, he like what I, I wrote and really upset a lot of his followers that there's a reason why people who have like a lot of skeletons in the closets who know they have that they're keeping secrets, have they have a vested interest in fueling this conspiracy culture because they are automatically protected from any kind of accountability. As soon as there's any accountability, it's part of the conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. And and that is something that he did right away. Um, and as soon as you say that, they, they, then, then they say that you're, you know, part of this network or trying to take them down. It's because you've got a lot of followers. It's because you're competing with them and so on and so on. But this would not be as successful as it is. You know, Russell, when, when Russell decided to really go full on into this world, it was a decision that he made during COVID. Um, his follower count exploded. You know, he, it was under a million, now it's seven million. And, um, and it's, I think it's because people are, feel misled, feel lied to, have a very, very, very strong sense that elites are screwing them over and they are not wrong. And we do a very, you know, I say in the book, conspiracy theorists, uh, conspiracy culture gets the facts wrong, but the feelings right. You know, the feeling of living in this world with shadow worlds, the feeling that people are, are keeping important truths to you, uh, from you. And I think because we, as a society, certainly in North America, we don't do, we don't teach political economy, you know, in, in uni barely in university, let alone, um, you know, high school. So, in fact, we tell people that capitalism is a meritocracy, that it's, you know, that it's bound with freedom, that if you work hard, you're going to get all the rewards, and, you know, it's, it's rainbows and Big Macs. And so when that system starts failing people on this huge scale, as it is right now, people start looking for answers. And that's when they're very, very vulnerable to somebody saying, well, there's a room somewhere filled with Jews and they're doing this, right? That's why, that's why anti-Semitism was referred to as the, as the socialism of fools. So, you know, I think there's a really, really important role for the left actually in doing, you know, basic, you know, political education, basic economic education about what capitalism is actually designed to do in terms of, you know, it's a, a system that requires an underclass, it requires dispossession, and yes, sometimes there are conspiracy theories, in or, not in order to drain children of adrenochrome, like the QAnon people are saying, but like <laughs> to protect, you know, a cop, an American company's copper interests in Chile, um, you know, which was one of the main reasons for overthrowing Allende 50 years ago. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that that's the biggest reason it's surging, is that capitalism is screwing over so many people at this phase. The system is, has, is like flagrantly breaking all of its promises, mm -hmm. you know, um, and so people are looking for explanations. Okay, I just realized we have so little time yet. <laughs> um, and we haven't even gotten to people's questions, and you have to do a reading. So um, I'm going to just ask you one of the questions okay. from... I don't have to do the reading. Okay, okay, well then I might... Go, I want to further than just okay. talk about what you were talking. Yeah. I want to just read um, what Ryan Grimm said, because I think it's, it's, it's looking at how we are seeding, the left is seeding yeah. Yeah. things. Um, let me just get this quote one second. Um, yikes, I just lost it. Um, Ryan Grimm said of your book, he said, that you get us to look in the mirror as well and ask what role we've played in seeding turf to the right or abandoning principles like skepticism of corporate greed and big pharma, opposition to censorship and mass surveillance, and so on, that have long been the domain of the left. By abandoning that territory, did we play a part in clearing the ground for the mirror world? And how can we reclaim our confidence and our voices in such disorienting times? I think that's such a critical question, right? Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, I think there's another piece of this around the way 
conspiracy culture always moves the horizon of outrage just a little bit off in the distance, like something that you're about to expose, right? You're about to prove that the election was stolen. Um, you're about to prove that 9-11 was an inside job. And what was, and, and I think that move of moving it away, um, you know, it simultaneously feeds off of left silences and failures, and that's, you know, what, what Ryan is referring to. But then you can also understand why figures like Donald Trump and Elon Musk and Steve Bannon would be so fond of conspiracy culture, because if you had a lot of interests within this system to protect, then you don't want people looking at the conspiracies in plain sight. Like, you know, the, the, the way... Um, it, just the, the way tech companies exploded their profits during the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, or any of the abuses that we know of and have already proven, and this is, you know, great journalism has pro proven it. You always want to be looking just off, just off in the distance. Um, so that's, I think, a really important thing to understand because that's part of the vertigo of our moment is that we have all of these Republican politicians who are talking about the elites, we're taking on the elites, we're taking on the globalists, we're taking on Davos, but the anger doesn't reach the elites, right? It's, it's just you, using these potent, this potent language, but then it always pivots to actually, usually the most vulnerable people. If you look at a figure like Georgia Maloney, um, who's one of, you know, one of the scarier figures in this world, um, Italy's new prime minister, whose who's, um, party Fratelli d'Italia has ties back to Mussolini. And she is part of this network that Steve Bannon has been building since he left the White House. He's been weaving together far-right political parties in Europe and South America. And Giorgia Maloney, she takes like, it, like issues around corporate power, banks that I recognize, right? Like, and, and she, she, she feeds off of those kind of abandoned issues where the left is not really talking that much about corporate power anymore, if there is a left. And, well, there are, are parts of the left. Um, but then she pivots it and it's all about transphobia and people who supposedly don't want her to be a woman. Um, and it's all about migrants and it's yeah. all about protecting you know, Christian culture in Italy. So you get the juice from the abandoned issues and then you pivot. That, that's the move, mm -hmm. yeah. I wanna just have a few questions that from the audience and um, Marcus Beam asked, climate change is getting worse. Based on what you've recently experienced and from your research on the book, do you believe that humanity has the ability to collectively tackle a significant problem like climate change? <laughs> no small question there. <laughs> Um, I mean, I have not given up. Um, I was part of a, there was a fantastic uh, march in New York uh, on, on the weekend, on Sunday. Um, you know, there were tens of thousands of people, maybe as many as 75,000, um, you know, demanding that there be uh, a climate policy in this country that actually is serious so that it isn't only, you know, Biden is doing a lot of really very good things on renewable energy, but he's simultaneously approving new fossil fuel infrastructure, and that's not the moment we're in. We actually need to make some hard choices. Um, but, you know, I think that we have this crisis of meaning that we've been talking about, where there's this wild co-optation of issues from left to right. But we also have ways that meaning is being eroded among the liberal center. Um, you know, and this is sort of, I, and in the book I quote Greta's amazing speech a few years ago at a climate summit where she basically just went, she went to Glasgow and just, instead of making, you know, earnest speeches calling out world leaders as people had come to expect from her, she just kept saying, well, it's more blah, blah, blah. Oh, they watered down the blah, blah, blah. Um, and, oh, green economy, blah, 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 build back better. You know? And I think it was one of, a great piece of political performance art, but the point that she was talking about was, you know, sure, these, there are some politicians who say all the right things, but if they're not doing it, 
then no, there isn't uh, any hope that we're gonna do anything about this. So I think that people are going to, I think we're gonna see more direct action. And I think we have to be very clear about what we're asking of our political leaders, which is not just saying the right things about climate change, but doing what is necessary guided by science. I, I think there is a shift. Do you think there's a shift? How do you feel? V premiered this absolutely incredible song at the rally. It was a really electric moment um, where, He's been working for years now on a musical called Wild, um, and it's it's good. I think it's I think we need art to sort of sh get us out of this stuck place that I think we feel, and I think we t kind of caught a glimpse of it when when um, those incredible um, musicians sang Wild for the crowd, and the crowd went wild, and it unlocked something of of just really just. I think believing that we really are in the moment we're in. And, and I think too, I just came back from Brazil where I was invited to the Indigenous Women's March, the third one, and seeing, you know, Celia and Sonia who have recently come to power in Brazil and the radical transformation that is occurring because of their presence in Congress and in the ministry and how much is changing quickly because they've come to power mm -hmm. gave me so much hope because their agenda is completely about obviously saving the biomes and making sure indigenous people determine their own reality because they have been protecting us forever and need to continue to do so if we're going to mm -hmm. remain alive. Mm -hmm. I think, I think we're, it's always for me both, mm -hmm. but I think what we all have to do, I love what AOC said at the rally, we all have to get bolder mm -hmm. and we all have to be more daring and we have to be more outspoken and we have to go to places we haven't gone before if we're gonna reverse it. Um, Adam Franklin asked you, I'm curious as to your thoughts on the recent union strikes from SAG to WGA to the UAW, are we seeing a resurgence of union back power after years of being weakened by the right wing? That's a great question. <laughs> it is a great question and I think we are. Um, and, and I think these strikes are very, you know, the, 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 the actor strike and the screenwriter strikes are also, I know there were a couple questions, I don't know if we're gonna get to them about AI, but it's very, I think, really exciting that, um, that artists are putting AI on the bargaining table and really standing up to this massive theft. You know, it, it's not about the technology, it's about, a, a, it's about the, incredible corporate consolidation that is happening. Um, it's a few players that are just laying claim to our very selves. I mean, talk about doppelgangers, right? Um, you know, I think this experience that I described, this uncanny experience that I described could well be coming for any of us if we allow our very identities to be mined and doubles to be of us to be mm -hmm. created. Um, you know, artists are on the front lines of, of this because uh, they are having to compete with their doppelgangers. This is what the studios want. And so it's really important that they're standing up. Um, you know, I'm a very excited about the UAW strike as well. Um, and, you know, this is another example, I think, of you know, the kind of social movement work that needs to happen. The reason the UAW is striking, standing up, to their bosses in the way that they are is because there was a democratic fight within the UAW. Sean Fain, the new president of the UAW, was an insurgent candidate for president. Um, and that was, you know, grassroots organizing, taking over a union that wasn't really representing its members very well. And this relates to the themes that we've been talking about, you know. There are all these questions about, you know, what do we do about the misinformation? And coming back to the question around, around the, the climate crisis, you know, on one level we could say, well, how are we gonna ever do anything about this if we can't agree on a shared reality? I think once we start doing things, it shakes people out, a lot of people out of this sort of um, feeling of just kind of watching the world go by. When there's a real offer about improving people's mm -hmm. lives, it's creating jobs, it's improving communities, it's lowering your energy costs, you know, you see those tangible benefits and then then I think the conspiracy influencers have a, many fewer buyers for what they're mm -hmm. selling. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, this, the the thing that I was going to say about Sean Fain, I don't know if you've heard some of his speeches where he's you know talking about the outrageous profits that these companies have made and the huge salaries that the CEOs are paying themselves, and yet workers are dealing with these massive cost of living increases and they can't keep up. You know, it's very populist. It's economic populism. He sounds a lot like Bernie. 
I believe that that is the best way to fight this, like to fight the, 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 the co-optation of, of our issues. It's not, it's not fact checkers, it's not deplatforming. it's not finding ways to shut them up. It's, it's taking away their most potent uh, issues, right? The reason why Steve, Steve Bannon is able to pick up issues from the left is because the left isn't using them enough. And when somebody like Sean Fain is suddenly all over the news, being a real populist, not a counterfeit populist. He's fighting for people to have raises that they need to feed their families. And that makes this whole Trumpy world look very, very fake because they're not really fighting for workers. These are the people that gave massive tax breaks to the already very, very wealthy. Um, so the, you know, this is counterfeit populism and the way, the way you fight it is by having, not being afraid of real economic populism on the left. That's brilliant. I just wanna say in closing, this book is truly a masterpiece. And it's, in my opinion, it's, it's Naomi's best book because it, it weaves the personal, it weaves everything into a, such a complex, deeply thought, wrought, researched understanding of where we are in the world right now. And I just urge everyone to read this book because I think sometimes, I, I, I don't know about all of you, I get so overwhelmed by, um, by the conspiratorial, <laughs> disappearance of fact and truth and where is it gone? And I feel like this book is a guide to how we deal with it. And I just wanna thank you so much, Naomi, for your bravery, for your brilliance, for your courage. I mean, going out and speaking truth and having to face the attacks of the right is no easy challenge. And I just wanna say we are grateful to you for all you do and for all the ways you have lifted us. Thank you, thank you everyone.